What's up, man? How you doing, dude? How you doing? How you doing? Uh, thanks for coming on. So, uh, it's been a, been a crazy time, man, getting this show up and running. I'm so glad to have you for my first guest and, uh, just wanted to dive in a little bit more, uh, into your history, uh, first and foremost, like where you come from, uh, who you are. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself and, uh, just give everybody a little spill of where you come from, what you're doing now. Well, as you said, my government name is Chris Campbell. Uh, go buy Panther Bread. I'll be supplying a plate. Uh, that's my music producer name. A uh, little side story on that. Because I live here in Charlotte, when I tell everybody my net, my producer name is Panther Bread, they swear it's the Carolina Panthers. Uh, I need you to just cut that out right now. That's blasphemous. Uh, like you said, right here, it's Philly all day. Uh, the Panther Bread comes from, I actually went to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so, uh, if you want to go with Panther Bread, that would be the original Panthers. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll forgive you. We'll forgive you for that one, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where I kind of got my start with the music thing. Um, DJing college radio stations, and I also played a little football with the team. Um, before you know, I kind of stepped out of school for a minute and took other adventures. But uh, yeah, that's where the Panther Bread comes from. But uh, otherwise, I was raised in Philly. You know. Philly all day, everything Philly. Uh, Mr. Food, uh, I guess you can hear how my, I haven't lost my accent. I have to find myself at work sometimes, kind of cutting down on the lingo because I uh, talk kind of fast. Um, but other than that, you know, that that's just where that, that hunger for everything that we what I do comes from because you see it all, you know, you, you, you live in the, in, in the slums um, we were homeless for a couple of years. Yeah, you t um, so tell me a little bit about that. So tell me what, what it was like growing up in Philly for you. Man, you know, I was, I, I was, I lived with a single mom who raised myself. I was the oldest, my sister and my brother, but we lived right around the corner from my grandmother who basically raised my mother, all of us at the same time. And uh, she also was in custody of cousins that just were not capable of taking care of them. so to keep the family together she you know she had them because the state gave them to her uh so we kind of all lived together so i would i say i have more brothers than more brothers than what what you would say uh government would say you know my cousins are my brothers um my mom she passed away when i was 16 um she had uh, hiv um, I had another aunt who passed away because uh, she was a drug, drug overdose type situation. And the last aunt that I had, my grandmother's the only child, still alive, and she's recovering. She's recovered, and uh, she's doing well right now. That's good. But that whole, that whole thing, just living around drugs, being around strong African-American females, raising young men, and one little girl, which is my little sister, you know, you, they... Just on that uh, food stamps, uh, like I said, we wound up homeless one time because my mother, she was kind of, she was strung out too and um, kind of forced me to grow up like early, you know? Um, so so when was the when was the first time that you realized music was for you? The irony to that is, is that uh, during that period, I kind of had to get into some things, uh, going out and selling the, the street narcotic uh, to kind of support the family. And it was kind of, um, it, I, I didn't look the part, which kind of went my way. And I would go to a lot of these whole house parties that we had. And you had live DJs and you would have the, the old boom boxes. And you got to remember, I, I grew up in that, uh, that early, mid 80s going into 90s. So I had the boom box, you know, that you saw Radio Raheem have on Do the Right Thing. Uh, <laughs> I actually was into the whole b-boy thing because i'm not gonna lie i had my linoleum floor so all day it was a linoleum floor with a boom box and i would get down there and do my b-boy and my thing and it was just that that oh did you ever walking. did you ever make your uh custom uh mixtapes i used to do that too man yeah i tried but see you know some people got to the point where they were just real good at it and I, my <laughs> mixtape just didn't it didn't work out you know <laughs> so i just figured i was sticking to the b-boy thing and um 
that didn't pan out either because uh, you know I, I kind of I got I grew up shot and I was lanky, so I didn't look right doing my pop lock. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I got got clown more than I did get the applause. So you know it, it kind of got to the point where I started understanding and hearing that that old gritty hip hop, that real hip hop. You know, and you know you got to realize too in Philly. Um, we had Philly soul, so we grew up with the OJs. Got Teddy Pendergrass, you know. I actually went to the same high school as Patti LaBelle. Uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff went to my high school. Um, so you, it was just infused. And then you got to realize too, we only two hours away from New York. So it was a rivalry, you know. So the, the, the music that originated from there, you know, we kind of had to reinvent our way with it. So you, you got that 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 rivalry that just got bigger, not only with the sports teams, but along with the music. Hmm. That's cool, so, man. So uh so you said you had to had to sell drugs to help support your family. That seemed to be you know, in inner cities that was that seemed to be the norm, unfortunately. So what got you out of doing that and into more productive things? What actually got me out of it was the fact that I always knew that I never wanted to be in it in the first place. I was too young to actually hold a job, so but it was kind of a fast money type situation. So I always kind of floated that way, knowing that that wasn't going to be my end all be all. Uh, watching, you know, the havoc that it was creating within my own home, I knew that I was contributing to that. And that kind of gets you where it's like that, yeah, you got to you gotta do better. But it's kind of hard to pull yourself from because you know you're able to maintain things, but you also have to keep this, this persona that you're not making enough or too much so that you're not, a, 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 you know, under the radar of law enforcement or the people that were older than you. Right. Um, it was just to get by, you know? And there were some times where I would kind of, I, I stopped doing it, and I realized that as I stopped doing it, now our lights are getting cut off in the middle of the winter. Um, the, the food stamps can't pay for enough food, you know? So it just, it, it's sort of that whole, what was the movie? Every time I try to get out, they just pull me back in type mm. situation. Yeah. And it, it just always resonated that I never, I wasn't, I wasn't really built for it, but I was able to do it because I was, I guess I was savvy enough to just fly under the radar. So is um, it mainly just because of lack of opportunity? Like you well, didn't me, because I was young. I mean, I wasn't even in my teenage years. You, uh, you know, paper routes that, that didn't that you didn't have that in the city. There's no such thing. Um, the only thing that we could get if your mother or your parents weren't able to provide the way that you you know that was comfortable was that. You know, you either used it or you dealt it, or you were just on the corner running the money. I just didn't. I, I did realize that much. I was smart enough to know being a corner guy. Just running the money, you don't get as much. We had to be one of the guys. So that's just what we went with. So know? do you remember how old you were when you first, uh, because I like to talk, like people from New York, I'm, I always ask, you know, I talk to them like, how old were you when you took the train or when you went by yourself that the first time to, to school or wherever? How, how old were you when you did that? I was actually six. I remember my mother, she told me, um, I'm gonna take boy. I'm gonna take you on this 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 train here or this bus. It's a trolley. We have trolleys. I'm gonna take you on this trolley here, and I'm gonna show you how to get down to the to do the subway, because I'm not gonna get up every morning and take you down here, you know. And she rolled me one time, and it was kind of like muscle memory after that. So the other concept to that is in Philadelphia. You know how I, I live in Charlotte now, and I watch all these kids get bused to school. Um. In Philly, after the fifth grade, uh, there is no bus system for you. So you either walking, somebody's driving you, or you're taking public transportation. So uh, you kind of get pushed into that early, <laughs> you know. Um, and then also another concept in Philly, which was kind of I, I kind of liked it, was it's sort of like the college uh, deal. You know, how where you live now, you you got to live in a certain area to go to a certain school. Well, in Philadelphia, for high school. They allow you to apply to the multiple schools in the area. If you're accepted, then they give you a, somewhat of a waiver to be able to travel to that school to go to school. Hmm. 
So that's kind of what we did. Um, I went to a college preparatory school. Um, it was called Bartram Motivation. And 99% of the kids that went there were accepted to a, a college. Not that they actually went, but they were accepted. So that was what you hung your hat on. Uh, and I actually had to, yeah, take the, the public transportation to, to get there uh, every day. So yeah, you, you, you start early. And I, like you say, a lot of people in New York don't even have a driver's license because they never, they don't have to. Um, finding that to be sort of the same way in Philly, but you know, I, I had to get my driver's license for my prom. <laughs> I wasn't renting a car. I'm going to drive myself. So that was my motivation to get my driver's license. So um, the music scene. So you said you were, uh, you started off as a DJ, correct? Uh, so so tell me what what was it like being a DJ in Philly? Well, I'm guessing mid mid nineties. I'm guessing around then. Yeah, you're talking mid nineties. I kind of got into it because we remember uh, this was when around the swing when CDs were starting to come out. So vinyl was still was still it. So you the, just the whole idea of going to the record store. You know, at the time we had Tower Records in South on South Street. Um, and you had your neighborhood, uh, almost like Sam Goody type places, and you just fingering through vinyl, old school stuff, buying a technique uh, uh, turntables and making sure the right needles. You know, I perfected on the, the with the 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 default needles that came with the uh, techniques, and then it was like uh, that ain't right because you can hear the crap and you can hear all the the, the static that come along with it. Um, that scene of trying to make sure your break beat matched, trying to make uh, tempos match, making the right cuts and the right right flips of, of your fader, that was just love, you know, because it was, it's, like I said, I was more of a chameleon on the, on the block because I was actually smart in the books. And the music, the irony to it is, it's a lot of math. Even though you hear it, it's a lot of math that goes with it. So. You're trying to make these complex mixes and scratches, and it just drew me, man. It, it, I, I was in, you know, and then I, I couldn't, you can't deny. That was just, so <laughs> I had no choice. I was just gravitated, I pulled, and it just stuck with me. Um, carried it over along with playing ball and doing school, went to college and linked up with a couple of guys that were from different places there, and we kind of like created a group called Man Down Productions where we actually were like the, the DJ crew that all the uh, this fraternities and sororities would hire to come do their parts. And on top of that, it was a seven man crew and we actually did local, we actually did clubs in, at Pittsburgh when we weren't doing parties. So we pretty much had the whole club scene in Pittsburgh locked down just from this one group. And you know, you, you kind of miss them days that taking your crates out the car, walking up. I remember we had this one place where had to get on an elevator, go to the top floor, dropping your crates off. You, you got free drinks, you know, of course, all the, you got all the females that come to you. And then also the other cool thing about the uh, college scene was if a uh, rival basketball team or football team, or I played on football, so I wasn't there during those seasons, but during rival basketball team would come to our club because the club was hot that Saturday or that Friday night after the game. So I've met like Ron Artest, who goes by Metal World, World Peace now, uh, Khalid el uh, a couple of people came through. And you, you kind of like your, your, your minor celebrity in your own right, but it's because your craft is good. And being that, coming going to Pittsburgh and coming from Philly and they had a guy from DC, we had another guy from Chicago, uh, New York, we put all that together. And man, cause you would get the house music, you get the reggae music, you get that East Coast, and a lot of us would we, we would within that little group we battled each other to learn who could do the better West Coast mixes. And then at the time, this is when the South was coming up because you know there was a time people where the South did not have it. <laughs> and um, I remember we would get white label records for stuff that wasn't out yet. If it didn't hit the uh, videos, they didn't know about it. So for instance, juveniles backed that ass up. I had it in my crate two months before I went on um, the, the the for the videos, and I would wow. play it, and people would leave the floor. And I said, "Okay, 
And I, I said it one day, I said, you're going to come back in a couple of weeks and, and want me to ask. Sure enough, the week I took it out of my crate, how many people wanted to ask for it? So that was love. You know, that that just being a part of that and feeling like you you were one of the people who was pushing things and, and pushing the needle. Music did that, you know, especially so, DJ. How crazy were those parties at the club? Bruh. bruh. <laughs> my God, you know, and the weirdest part about that is you got to realize we were college students who were DJs, right? Um, we weren't even drinking ages, but we did our thing, you know. And then on top of that, you, 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 like I said, you were that, you were the celebrity of that area, that place. Even yeah. though I wasn't from there, people knew who I was because, hey, you wanted DJs, yeah. Yo, can you get me in? You know, that was the first thing. Oh yeah. Then the second thing was, you know, like I said, we had seven of us, so we each would take a set. And so now you get to come down on out, out the booth and go get your free drink. So now I can get my free drink and pass it to, you know, a little cutie. And, hey, things happen. <laughs> things happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. I, I Honestly, that sounds very familiar because when I was uh, playing music, I was playing in bars before I was 21. Like, I turned 21 in a bar at a, in a gig. And so I know it. But, yeah, you're right. The first question is, can you get me in? Yeah. Right. Can you put me right. on the list? Yeah, or sure, man. They can't, they come right when you take your stuff out. Can I help you bring this yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'll be your roadie for tonight, man. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, dude. So, so what happened? So, you said you played football in college, correct? Yeah. Um, walked on at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where, uh, at the time, Johnny Majors was there. Walt Harris took over. Um, yeah, that was a great experience. It really was. It make now. I will say this too. You know, I, I'm not much. I don't know. I don't want to make it a political situation, but NCAA needs to stop paying those those, those kids because I, I was a part of that. And those schedules is crazy. You know, five in the morning, go on the run. After the run, about seven, you go lift weights. You lift weights. Mm-hmm. Then you go to class from nine to twelve. Come back. You eat lunch with the team. Then you you, you do film. You go back to another class, you come back about four o'clock, <laughs> you know, you work, yeah. you actually, you, you actually practice, then you, you eat dinner, then you go and do an, another film session, then you go do your homework. Now, mind you, I said you woke up at five, right? By the time all that's done, it's about 11 o'clock. You still got homework to do. And then you do that all over again. Um, hmm. But it brings you closer. And like I said, that was the kind of, it was cool because practicing and playing with those guys and then going and um, doing DJ stuff. You had a different, a different seat, a different feeling about how college life was, you know, you had the hardships then you kind of had some easy times because the football team got, they got fed well, don't, don't, don't let me get, Hey, they got fed well. And then just, man, those Saturdays, dude. Oh, uh, ah, I, I mean, I remember, First game coming out of that tunnel, it was against, it was called a, a what was it, Louisiana Lafayette, some raging cages. And because it was the first game in the season, you come out and I played at a high school now, get it, Philadelphia, public league, public league. We, we didn't have any benches. There was no such thing as grass. It was just straight dirt. Uh, we had no cheerleaders. <laughs> so <laughs> to go to that, and then it's like 20,000 people screaming. Dude. Oh, um, I remember just the 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 spring game. I couldn't hear. Like I'm I, I'm not I'm not a I'm not, by no means am I a shy dude. But you come out there and you see all these people, they're there for a practice, man. You know, the, the infamous uh what was that? The infamous uh Alan Iverson rant that it was like it was practice, you know, it's practice, man. We, we actually were out there and it was, I couldn't hear what the dude was saying. And I was hooked, you know, and three weeks later, um, I went out the tunnel and we were playing Notre Dame. I, I can't tell you that, that experience, their, their band was bigger than our whole students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those legendary gold helmets. And it was a pretty day. It was just glaring. It's 
it's an experience, but you you love it because you know what you put into it. Those mornings that you wake up and do all the work just to get out there for that Saturday. And, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, man. Like, I didn't think about that uh, in terms of paying paying the kids, uh, the college players, man. Like, yeah. I, I didn't realize, I mean, I didn't think, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, when I went to college, you know, I went to Western for a year. So, I mean, I, I got to see their football, you know, team. Some of them would come to class and, you know, elsewhere. But, uh, like, I didn't realize how much you guys work, like, all the time. It's like yeah. it's during season, it's it's on the you're on the grind. That's cool, man. It's, I didn't I never heard that perspective before. Um, awesome. So so when you were playing Notre Dame and it was a nice day, it's uh make it. So what position did you play again? Wide receiver. Wide receiver. So was it hard like defenders like glaring off their helmets when you're trying to catch the ball and everything? You know, actually, you, you get beyond that. It's more or less how big these guys are just jamming you on the line. So at the point you ain't worried about the helmet. You just worry about, can I get out this damn stance to get to my route? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I said, I wasn't a big guy. So I was, I had to be real crafty, savvy. And, you know, I actually, Walt Harris actually gave me um, the nickname creatine man. Cause I was the skinniest thing on the team. So when we had our, our break between summer or after, before the season come for spring, they were dishing out uh, tubs of creatine to everybody. Mm -hmm. He actually came when he said, come here, creatine, man. He gave me two. He said, I don't want to see a drop of these things in here when you get back. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, he said, you need, to, yeah. you need to put some weight on, dude. You need to put some weight on you, bro. So <laughs> that was how that went. That's awesome. So, so what happened after college, man? Well, actually, the... I wasn't doing too well with uh, everything going on back at home. My grandmother, she was sick. My, like I said, my mother had already passed away. And um, I didn't, uh, academically, I didn't, I couldn't stay. So I actually got a job. <laughs> I went as a temp agency and I was actually at a paper mill. I think I was there for two weeks where I was actually just, you know, them old, the old uh, cutters that they used to use for your, uh, your construction paper and the art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to do that and cut whatever these little pamphlets were and fold them and put them into a, 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 a envelope. I uh, remember get the every day for like two weeks. I said, "Yeah, I need y'all to find me something else," you know. <laughs> so I became a paternity clerk at the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas. So I was the one who processed the the orders to send out to. Uh, fathers to come and get their, uh, their, their cheek swabbed up for that paternity test so that they can set you up for that uh, child support. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that was me. And, uh, but the pay sucked. Uh, I actually tried to uh, get them to transfer me to Philadelphia doing the same job. But, you know, guess what? My job was more of a female, feminine type of job. I didn't care. I just did stuff. And uh, they... They didn't want to move me because the people that were there were kind of already stuck in their positions. They weren't leaving. You know, they get $15 an hour in Philly. We were getting $9 an hour in Pittsburgh. Um, so times got rough and I kind of I called my dad and he was in Germany at the time. And I was like, I got to find something out. You know, I, got, I can't live this way. And he said, I know what I'm about to um, propose to you. Your mother probably be rolling her grave, but you either go to Detroit where he was from and live with some relatives and try to find a job go back to philly without really a job or go into the military uh going to philly wasn't gonna work because i told you i was already going through tough times when i was younger so i already knew my mindset would probably go back to that and now that i was older it would probably be a lot deeper than i needed to be right yeah why and then <laughs> and then it was uh i just went to the i i, I went in to try to go into the air force I took the ASVAT. I did very well on the ASVAT. Oh, mind you, caveat, I was 23 years old during this transition. So when I went in, I was trying to go in the Air Force. I took the test. I knocked it out the water. They came to me and said, hey, it was like a phone book size. Pick any of these jobs. You, you, you got the grade. You got the scores for it. And one of them was uh, aer aerospace. I was trying to go to NASA, man. <laughs> and... um. He said, sure, I think we get we, we got those spots. Let us go back here and do some clerical stuff and we'll come right back. 
About 20 minutes later, he comes back and he gives me a book that's probably uh, this size. I don't know if you can see that. He says, yeah, um, since you're 23, we had to run your credit. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah, you can't have any of these jobs. <laughs> so you you need to pick from this booklet. Man, oh, you talk whoa, about- whoa, 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 back up, back up. So, <laughs> whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Let me get this straight. So the military runs your credit. Check, Dep- <laughs> depending on what job you want. Yeah, and now it's, it's depending on your age. Now, if I went into the military straight out of high school, they, you know, you, you don't have credit, right? right? But because I was over the age of 21, they ran my credit. So basically what that concept was, was that I am a national security hazard because my credit was so <laughs> jacked up that if I was to get caught, any country was going to bribe me to get any information. So let alone being in aerospace and, and NASA, you cannot have this job. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't think about that, man. But it's it's true. Like, I mean, what would have you done though? Like, they're like, "Hey, man, we're gonna pay off your credit." <laughs> That's crazy, dude. Oh my god. So anyway, so 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 you had to pick from a book this big instead of this big. Instead of this big. <laughs> and, uh, so. The weird part about it, only as I'm flipping, I'm like, I don't want any job. The only ones that looked like something were one was police, the other one was firefighter, and another one was missile maintenance. I said, what the hell am I do with missile maintenance when I get out? I do something on the black market? What the hell? And I said, I ain't being no cop, and I'm not going to no firefight. So we got to do something. We got to do better. We got to do better. Um hmm. But what wound up happening was I actually had, I moved to Germany uh, with my dad for about nine months because I, I initially, with, this, with the Air Force, I had uh, swore in. You swore in two times. The first time is basically so that the uh, recruiter can get your name on there as one of their uh, quotas. And the second time is the real thing. But when I swore in the first time, it kind of locked me in with the Air Force. So I had to go, I was trying to get out of that because I wanted to go in the army because the army actually had an IT position that I was looking at and I had the scores that I could get into it. But the only way I could do that is if the Air Force released my packet to the army. It took them nine months. Two of letters course. to my congressman. Of course, of course. Two letters to my congressman. Uh, I, I spent time working in, um, in, in, in Germany and lo and behold, while I was in Germany, I was working in a place called the Power Zone, which is like the military's version of Best Buy. Mm-hmm. And I was in the music department selling the CDs. You know, remember when the CDs used to come out only on Wednesdays and Fridays? I was that guy. So I was always now here. I went back in the music business like, hey, that new Tupac is coming out with the John B. Y'all got it. I ain't got to, to Wednesday. Hey, can you put my name on it and hold it to the side for me? You know, so um, <clears throat> one of the guys that was there, his name was, uh, he, he he had a group, a rap group, and they had a nice little buzz going on over there, and he produced. Go mm. figure. And um, I kind of went in, I told him I did some music, and we went to his house a couple times, and I kind of learned how to use the MPC uh, 2,000 at the time. And um, that's where the, the production bug kicked in. So this was in 99. It, it, it picked up. I was like, ah, I like this. This, this is almost sort of like the, the DJing thing, only I can build it off of my own. Right. And um, when I went, the only issue with that was by the time I got into uh, the military, I didn't have the time, you know? Um, you go to a military, you go to boot camp or what they call basic training. And then and this was in. army. Yes. After remember I, the, the air force finally released my, my stuff. Right. And I went on over and I joined the army, um, went through uh, basic training then, which was in Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, anybody who's been in the military, if you watch this, you know, in Fort Benning, Georgia, that means there's nothing but guys. I was around dudes. For two months, the only time I saw females when they marched us all, all our bald heads to the to the to the <laughs> the PX to go get our toiletries, and you saw the the cashier. It didn't matter what that woman looked like; it was a woman. 
<laughs> um, after after I graduated basic training, I had to go do what they call AIT, is where you actually go learn your job because basic training is you being a soldier and learning discipline. Right. To uh, Fort Gordon, Augusta, Georgia, right outside of uh, what's the, the Masters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was there for like 22 weeks, left there, went back to Fort Benning, but this time I went to jump school. When you learn how to jump out the, out the school, out the uh, airplanes, I did that. Mm-hmm. Right. right. I'm good. So. I'm not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. There's no <laughs> way. And you know, I don't even want to know the crazy part about it is half the people had never flown on a plane. The first time they got on it, they were jumping off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so how was that man i was jumping out of planes dude like i've never dude, dude you you talk about the fear and then the thing is, is that you go out of this little teeny door like it, it's it, it's just big enough to suck you and your pack out and like i said i said it suck because you don't have time to jump because the air is going suck gone. <laughs> and uh, but you want to know the crazy part about it i was in the class with pat tillman so the um that was kind of cool you know because i already we knew his story coming in but he was actually in my jump class who pat tillman the the pro football player that left from arizona cardinals went into the military and then was killed by a friendly fire oh well, i heard that story yeah look it up yeah oh. so pat was tillman pat tillman huh i was in the same class with pat tillman um and I was actually in there with these crazy Marine guys. And come to find out, I forget the name of the store. Uh, the, I, I, it wasn't Band of Brothers. It was another military-based uh, TV show on HBO. And the three Marine guys that were on my in my actual class, they cast them on that show. <laughs> so it was like, I was in this... I was in like the what they call it the Hollywood <laughs> jump school, you know, <laughs> and it was kind of cool. That's crazy. Um, but coming from that, I did three weeks there, and then my first duty station, the only duty station, I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I was uh, with Special Forces Support Group and deployed a multiple number of times. I did six. I'm proud. So I uh, went. I was in from 2002 to 2009, and um, around 2008, I really got back into trying to figure out this whole music thing. Um, in between, I still had one of my guys from the the DJ crew. His name is Greg. We called him Redhead. He was the uh, we did the reggae reggae segment, and we also had a reggae uh, college radio station. He mm-hmm. and I went to business together, and we actually had a uh, what we thought was a record label at the time. We called it Wall Street Entertainment. Um, we had a pretty good little roster going on, and but the problem was we were always trying to look for producers. Hence, I was like, I could do this, and um, I tried to rekindle the whole NPC days that I learned over in Germany. And but because I had my military uh, engagements, I wasn't able to do as much as I wanted to. And that kind of was with something that was always on my mind. Like, I felt like, you know how you got these guys. I think me and you talked about it before. You got some people who just, they have something in them that says, I'm going to do this no matter what. Right. And it was music. And I never had that that bone. <laughs> and um, that's why the IT thing coming out of the military was what has fed my family. But here I am in my, you know, I'm not going to say my later years, my middle age, pre-middle age. Let's go with that one. Um, I have the the wisdom and the the drive to, to pursue this thing. So once I got out of the military and I found the good jobs and all that kind of stuff, I used my GI Bill <laughs> that, I, that I earned over that six years. Absolutely. And I went to an online course at uh, Full Sail University. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah. Full Sail University, um, where I actually went and got a bachelor's in science, which I didn't know was a bachelor's in science. I thought it was going to be a bachelor's in arts. It was a bachelor's in science. Um, 
for music production. And it gave me a little bit more insight on this 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 new way of doing things because, like I said, we 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 came up with the the old turntables and the NPCs and samples and trying to find the right break beats and the right kicks to do all this. And now it's all digital. So now I was learning a DAW, and uh, you're testing this. I I had to bring my homework to work sometimes to try to figure it out, and. You know, it's just like, like we always say, you just keep being persistent about stuff that you do. And if you love it enough, you'll figure it out. That's and right. that's well, I, I want to say from everybody watching and me, thanks for, thank you for your service, first and foremost. Because um, that's some crazy shit, especially <laughs> jumping out of planes and shit. <laughs> um, so th can you explain to everybody what Full Sail University is? I don't, uh, probably a lot of people don't, don't know outside of, you know, the circle. So Full Sail University is an actual, it's an actual university. It's down in Florida, uh, Water Park, Florida. It's actually a neighbor to UCF, University of Central Florida. They have a campus, they actually have dorms. Um, but it's basically a school for everything entertainment. It's not just music production, it's graphic design, it's audio, um, photography, uh, man. I, they have an internship and a partnership with WWF. There's multiple uh, people who've gone there where, you know, they, they're Grammy Award winners and nominated for all types of things. You got to realize you don't just get a Grammy just for the music that you hear on the radio. You can get a Grammy for being the sound engineer for a great film, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so what do it's they, they do basically anything entertainment they do. It's, it's accredited. Um, it's a, to me, I'm being for what it's done for me. <clears throat> it's a pretty good school. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are some people who feel obviously because they, it doesn't seem like they may offer everything that they say that they will, but you got to realize <clears throat> just because you graduate and you're an alum, you still have to put the work in and go find certain things for yourself. They may have the tools and the resources to assist, but they're not going to be able to guarantee you anything. Right. That, that's, yeah. That, that's every college, man. A lot, a lot of people, you know, I, I completely understand. So, I mean, they're just giving you the tools to be successful. It's up to you to be successful. Um, so what, what are you doing now in terms of music? So right now, um, <laughs> what are you doing? Are you... <laughs> how many, how many sports jerseys have we seen in this interview so far? Listen here, listen here. I, I am everything Philly. So I had my flyers. Then no first yet yeah, was flyers, Phillies, Sixers. And you know, if you're a true Philadelphian, you know, it's always go birds. So I had to end with this because if you see in the back, that's my logo color. So. Just to let it be known, my panther is green. Not what's that y'all got? What's that? No, no, okay, all right. Let me let me let me just stop. Let me stop you there for a good. Stint. <laughs> then, uh, all right. So uh, let me give us some background. So I worked with Chris for a while, right? I will tell you when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, you did not find another uh, person that was more annoying. <laughs> the, <laughs> that just, I mean, you went to you went to the parade, didn't you? Oh, I sure did. I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, you gotta love, you gotta love some Eagles fans, right? <laughs> the best in the world. Yeah. All right. Um, so, anyway, some music. What are you doing now in music? Right now, uh, a world. Listen here. Uh, I have a, I have a good ear for this stuff. Like I said, I grew up in Philly. I grew up on that Motown sound. The fill up the soul sound, that early '80s, that real, that real boom bap stuff. I'm not going to clown or say anything about what today's today's outlook on on music is. But just understand, you've heard it from me. That old '90s feel, that old boom bap trap style stuff that's coming about. It's coming, it's coming back. back. It's coming it's back. Coming. Absolutely, so, dude. I'm I'm hearing it now, man. Yes, it's coming back. So. Uh, I guess I'm going to tell my age, I am four, but I don't look it. I've always said, you know, you always think back to the things that you say you wish you should have could have done, right? I'm at an age now where I understand what I should have did then and what I can do now. 
and I'm pursuing. So the outlook I have is I've learned, I'm learning how you youngins do this, this, this social media thing, this digital way of making music. Um, revamping my uh, personal websites, my, all, my, all my social medias. But in the meantime, I work from home. So majority of the time after I'm doing my, my work that pays the bills, I'm in here on my craft. Uh, I make a track a day, maybe two, mix master my own stuff, submit some stuff for music libraries. Um, I'm actually creating a, a personal EP right now. Um, I've been in partnership with Bungalow Entertainment as well as So So Icy Entertainment, uh, uh, Raw Banger Entertainment to create this particular EP because we do have an uh, outlet to have a distribution deal to Universal uh, via Bungalow Entertainment. Uh, so like a DJ Khaled type thing because I don't rap, but the tracks that will be on it are mine. The talent that's behind it is in the studio with me and we're perfecting these things along with, like I said, sending stuff to musical operators. Uh, I'm not just hip hop and R&B. I've done some alternative, some pop. I even got the, a gospel feel that's going on. Um, thanks to some inspiration from the church that I go to now. Another plug for uh, the Lindless Church in Greenville, South Carolina, like the best music and um, ministry there is. It's just like going to a concert every Sunday. So it, it keeps me on my toes with that as well. Uh, supplying this plate, real talk. Um, I got I got some stuff that I think we, we could set on fire with industry and anybody now. And I'm proud of it because it's it's a maturation behind it. And, and, it's, and the weird thing is I don't have a lot to a catalog from a before and after. This is now, you know, so I pull in a lot of the inspiration from those 90s and uh, late, uh, late 80s <clears throat> feel that we have and then marrying it with with the sound that these young is like, but I'm also appealing to Neo so, you know. That's so, what's going so, on. Well, well, so let's back up. Let's back up for a second. So you said uh actually when I first when I first met Chris, uh I was talking to a a, a mutual friend of ours and he played me a track and he was like he was like, yeah, man, you didn't know Chris worked with this guy? Blah, 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 blah. He started telling me about him. So can you tell everybody w what that claim to fame right there was? I'm not going to say it's a claim to fame. No, but, but you know, you know uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big accomplishment, man. I, w I, was, I was a part of helping to put together the J. Cole's first major thing with the Who Dat. I was in Fayetteville just coming out of, because again, Fort Bragg is another area. And I just kind of uh, got out of the military and I was getting back into it. And that, if you listen to it, you know what song back in the day really on my way in, in the college was that, uh, what was that, the Trick Daddy song that had the, 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 the college band in it? Oh yeah, yeah. I was inspired by that and that's where that who that track kind of came in. So it kind of, it, it, it married itself. You know what the business is, what the business is. You, you get your, you get a little bit of, of, of say in some things and you know, you kind of got to keep hitting people. And at the time, you know, I really wasn't embedded, but yeah. So what was the name of that? Is that was Jake? J. Cole and who dat is that? Yeah. Let's see if you can find um, it on YouTube that way everybody can look it up. We've also done um some we, Yeah, we, yeah, everybody if you want to hear the song, just look up J period C O L E Who Dat uh on uh YouTube and you can check out that song. So anyway. Sorry about that. Yeah. We've um with the the Wall Street Entertainment thing, we, we did some uh, we did some work with uh, one of our, our artists. His name was Sice, and he he, he got in the studio with some some some, some pretty good producers at the time. Um, so it kind of brought me into this field. Like I gotta be versatile, 
And right now where we're at dealing with what we're dealing with in this climate, you don't have to necessarily be in one of those big, big areas of the country, right? To be noticed. This social media thing is helping out a lot of people. And I think that you just be persistent, always make sure that you're making yourself your 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 brand and your business, and we can make this thing move. Cool, man. Um, so you mentioned putting your music in a library. Can you explain to the the people listening what is a music library and why you chose to stick more of that route versus doing the traditional uh, recording studio type type gigs? Okay, understand people, in listening now, if you're a music producer, for the longest time being a music producer or what we, a lot of cases, beat maker, you're always tracing the dream of having your radio, your, your song heard on the radio. Uh, but if you realize now, this day and age, not too many people even really listen to the radio, everything is streamed, or you even have satellite radio, things of that nature, right? Well, Realize the same way you sit down and you make your music and the same way you sit down, you listen to the stream, uh, radio stations, <clears throat> the movies that you watch, the YouTube channels that you watch, the TV shows that you watch. A lot of us will watch the, you can't get away from reality TV shows, Netflix, Hulu, all those shows, when you listen, when you watch them and they're moving from scene to scene, you hear music. Well, the music supervisors for those particular shows or the network that they're on, they don't have this whole, what do they call like the Motown sound? They don't have a whole band that's sitting in the back that makes just tracks for everything. The supervisors go to a trusted music library that they go and they peruse for sound of whatever they're thinking of a scene or the entirety of a show. Well, you as a producer who sits at home and, you know, spends book money on all your equipment, you can actually make a track that you submit to a library. And if you strategically submit it to a particular library, strategically name it properly, have the particular feel of, of, of any kind of track, or if you that music library and see what type of tracks they like and you build something that's similar to what winds up happening is you you say you take that pp that thing and leave it on your uh desk on your computer move it to music catalogs but you don't try to sell it to any other artists or anything you just submit it what happens is those music supervisors go and peruse and they say oh i like this they'll put your sh they'll, they'll, they'll if it's if, when it's formatted and mixed and produced in a way that they can chop it and lay it into different sections of, of, of a show, you might not even watch the show. Your uh, publisher, your ASCAP, your BMI will get notified because they had all those shows have to put out split sheets. Split sheets indicate where they got the music from, who was produced by, and you get a chat, <laughs> you know? Um, sometimes you know it's gonna happen, a lot of times you don't, but you get a chat and it's the greatest thing. And the good thing about that is, if you do produce, or say you're producing a song for an artist, okay, the next day you produce one to submit for a, a music library. And the more that they play those things, uh, you get a check. And understand, because it's in the music library, they don't have to use it just one time. They don't have to just use it just for one particular uh, show. It can wind up in multiple shows. Hmm. It can wind up internationally. So I've seen where a lot of people, and this is why I went this route. Well, I'm not saying I'm going this route. It's, it's a way to have a little bit of residual and also some consistency. Because remember, you might not get that artist that's going to pay you that big buck check or that artist that's going to blow up and have so many streams that your royalties just keep coming in. Or that artist that's going to make it where your track is that one that's heard and now everybody's clamoring for you in the industry. Right? Whereas if you make these and you send it, it's almost like sending yourself out. It's like a, a IRA or CD, right? You put it out there and over time, it'll, it'll, it'll mature. Put it out there. I mean, it gets on the library. It gets on a couple of shows. I've seen where some of the guys that I've dealt with, uh, Gummy Beats and Clinton Music, 
Uh, those are the two people that I, I follow on YouTube and Instagram. They're real inspirational about this stuff. Uh, yeah, they got stuff. They, they live very good lives. And you don't know who they are. But those music libraries know who they are. So, um, have you been, have you, any of your songs been picked up off the music library? One actually got picked up on a show that I love to watch is uh, Forged and Fire. <laughs> For, Forged uh, and Fire? Forged yeah. And Fire. Um, just randomly took one. It just so happened to be, it was like a, uh, it was almost like a pop song with a little bit of, of, uh, country sound to it. Uh-huh. That's what Forge and Fire is. Let's be real, it's, it's, it's more geared to, you know, the Southerner, the type of, uh, of uh, follower. And right. I, I love this. I love watching them build knives and, and swords out of basically nothing. Yeah. And, uh, it's almost sort of like, yeah, if you ever watch Moonshiners, yeah. You, I, once it's on, I can't stop watching. <laughs> 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 so yeah I, I just happened to be sitting there one day and all of a sudden boom i heard it and then i got a, a letter and it showed you know the, the actual episode how much of it they used it was like 25 seconds and the name of the uh episode that they used it for that's awesome and it is so and then remember, remember too if they run a rerun you get paid again <laughs> I mean, but but what does that check look like that one wasn't big. I'm not going to lie. Um, you have to just understand. You have to be persistent and know know your uh, work. What's that? Workflow mm-hmm. when you're producing. Because whatever that workflow was for you to get that placement, you kind of want to mimic that all the way across. And as you're in the main thing for us producers is uh, not don't just learn how to compose. Learn how to mix and master. Because you might have to do a submission and you don't have time to send it off and wait for it to get back. And then also think, you just sent it off. Maybe you pay a, a flat rate for that, but maybe the 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 you know the income that comes back from it when it's on a particular show doesn't match what you had to do for mixing and mastering. You get my point? Mm-hmm. Try to keep as much as you can in the house. And then um, when you do put it in, that one wasn't big, but you know what? I, I, I put so many out. And, as of late, I know that something will catch. And again, I, I go to sleep at night and I can sh- go to my ass cap one day and it'll just pop, uh, it'll come in there. Uh, give me something, what else are we doing anyway? You know, just think about it. You're making music for people to hear. It. Not everybody's gonna like every flavor, but you, what are you doing? Just make it to sit on your on your hard drive? No. If, if you know it's something that's formatted for a particular show, just submit it and then Leave it in your hard drive and know that it's out there and then produce more music for people if you want to chase the river. I have people that come in and, like I said, I'm doing the EP. That doesn't mean I have to stop chasing the radio. I just know that there's other possible opportunities. Right. Diversify your income stream, which is yes. which is not just a music thing. It's it's a all careers thing. All um, careers. If you diversify your income stream, you're protecting yourself for when things inevitably go bad right um the economy like whatever right so as as long as and that's for streamers that's for uh music producers or musicians that's for artists just diversify your income stream that way you're not hedging all your bets and you know on one thing so so if something fails you'll constantly have that backup plan um and you, you you won't get hit so hard um, I, I hear that so much, you know, when, when people give advice is always diversify that your income stream. Um, uh, that's awesome, man. So, uh, let's, let's get down, let's get nerdy because I'm a, I'm a musician as well. And, uh, I want to know what gear you're using, man. Like, talk to me about, talk to me about your setup. All right. So this right here is my, uh, beat machine, my baby, uh, Machina MK3. Do pretty much a lot on this thing, but I generally use it for uh, my drums uh, because it's nothing like when you're trying to actually do your, you know, your thumbs and your fingers to, to make your drums hit, then to be clicking and drawing it into a, a DAW. So that's that first thing. Uh, I'm actually on a Mac Airbook 2014 edition. Got that from school people. That yep, that came in my packet. 
still works. Still running it, love it to death. Uh, <laughs> knock on wood. I don't have no wood in here. I got to find some wood. The only wood I have, I can't knock on. But uh, yeah, we uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh. So what do you use, Logic? Since you're on the Apple. I'm in Logic. Uh, Logic. I actually do all my composition in Logic. Other than if I'm using the uh, Beat Machine MK3, and my actually doing my mixing and mastering. I'm trying to find my way of keeping it all in there. Yes, I did used to switch between that to Pro Tools, um, but I figure I gotta have everything in one stop shop sometimes because I'm I'm on the move, so I don't want to have to click between two dogs. Um, inside of my studio here now, I'm rocking with the Rocket. Five says my studio monitors. I have two Samsung, uh, what's that, curve monitors that I'm you, viewing you, between the two. You got, you got curve monitors? Really? Yeah, I do. I do. Are they nice? Face age, you know. Just, I, yeah. want some, I want some curve curve monitors. Yeah, they're side by side, 24 inch joints. <laughs> it's, it's like a, it's, yeah. Oh, but by uh, the way, by the way, guys, if you want to take a look at his studio, um, Next, I think maybe this Saturday, I'm going to try to, to film us making an intro for uh, Common Careers for at least the, the YouTube edit. So you'll get to see a little bit behind the scenes and, and inside his studio. So uh, stick around and uh, that'll be posted on our uh, YouTube channel at Just Common Dude um, here in the next week or so. So check that out. That's awesome, man. So anything, any other gear you want to shout out before we uh, move on? That focus right, Scarlet 2i4. Two, two Audio. Audio that interface. Thing, the audio interface works. Uh, what else do I run with? Alchemy as one of my VSTs. I love Alchemy. Captain Chords. I think I showed you how <laughs> initially when it first came out, how you you producers are cheating now. Hey. Totally cheating. Uh, <laughs> that was my oh, response. That was my response. Oh was, my God. You're cheating. This, this thing actually gives you chord progressions and melodies and you don't even know how to know theory. It's cheap, but <laughs> hey, I ain't gonna lie. Sometimes I get lazy, and I don't be feeling like thinking. I, I'm stuff. only saying that because I know I would totally use that all the yeah, time. <laughs> it, it comes in handy sometimes. So you, you, if you get writer's block and you got cap records, something wrong with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, contact library. Oh, uh, we have uh, someone in chat that just asked, asked about Vegas. Didn't something special happen in Vegas? Pretty recently? Oh, really? oh yeah. So oh wow, really? Yeah, uh I'm engaged. <laughs> so I actually have a uh a wedding that I'm planning. It's gonna be ne this next June. So no 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 no. Tell them about what happened during the proposal because that video was hilarious. Come on, man. All right. So here it goes. So the whole day she and I were there and we were we were actually there for a 40th uh surprise 40th birthday party for one of my childhood friends. And so the, earlier that day, we, we were the first to arrive. And I had already bought the ring and left it in the room and all that good stuff. And we were, I was actually uh, reconning some places where I could do the big proposal. So went to the Bellagio. And you know, outside the Bellagio, they have that fountain that goes to the music. And I thought that would be a good place. But the problem with that is it doesn't, the fountain doesn't go the whole time. It's only certain times of the day that the, the, the music goes and then it goes. So I said, yeah, that's not going to be good. So we walked in and they had this uh, flower exhibit and they had these two huge peacocks that were shaped like a heart. I said, that would be a great place. And um, so when we went back to the room before one of our friends was trying to get a little rest, I got the ring, slipped it to my buddy. And remember, I said we were there for a surprise 40th for one of my other friends. Well, he was totally oblivious that we were even going to be there. So he was definitely oblivious about this particular proposal. <laughs> so when we walked to the, um, you know, we walk in and it's like this enchanted forest and walking towards this, this, the, the, the big, uh, pellet, uh, what's those peacocks. Everybody kind of got in position to get ready for me to do this proposal. What we, we plan was everybody would go take a picture at this particular thing. Well, my buddy who, who's the, the birthday boy, he starts to wander off. And we're like, hey, yo, come back. And he's like, hold on. I'm like, no, no, you got to come back. <laughs> so he's walking over, and his wife's like, get, get over here. So they take that picture. Then my other friend who had my ring, he went, and they were taking the picture. So when we came up to take ours, my, me and my fiance, that's when he kind of slipped me the ring, right? 
So we stand there and I'm holding her. I got her, I got her and I'll give her a kiss on the cheek and get ready for the picture. And she's all about pictures. So she's getting her little pose and she goes to pose. And I said, you know, I love you, right? She's like, yeah, I know you love me. <laughs> Just ready for the pose, right? <laughs> so <laughs> when she goes over, I get down on my knee and I'm already down there and I open it. And I, I did good with this ring. The ring was hot and the light was shining. It was blinding for me. And so she she's still in full pose and she then she kind of realizes that I'm not there. And she goes and looks and looks down and she looks and she says, stop playing. What you mean stop playing? <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh my God, stop playing. Girl, I'm down here. What am I playing about? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's felt like you never realize it felt like attorney. I'm like, am I really down here? And now you remember it's in, it's in a public forum. So now the proposal is actually public. And I'm like, if she tell me no right now, I'm going to look like a butthead. But I'm down there and she's just a such shot. She just, so finally the, all the people who knew were like, is that a yes? You know, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Finally put it on. And, yeah, you guys you know. should see the video. It's hilarious. Her utter s just shock of like, what is going on right now? <laughs> it's so funny. Um, that's awesome, man. I like. When's the wedding again? Uh, it's gonna be in June sixth of twenty twenty. Awesome. Well, you you know you can count me there. All right, dude. So, yeah. what are the future plans? You said you got an EP coming out. Anything else beyond that you're working on, or you want to pursue, or what's going on for the for the future of uh, Panther Bread? Uh, constantly going to push out the stuff to the music libraries. I'm always going to keep creating because I'm thinking I feel like music's just going to be ever changing. So I know there's going to be some stuff that some artists are going to get on. Uh, I actually have some still some connections down in Atlanta. I have a buddy who's actually talking on a possible. It's almost like an internet, um, what do you want to call that, TV show. And he said that he's the music director. And he immediately came to me and said, you're going to create the theme and you're going to throw all the music that I need to come for that. So that's something that's in the works. Awesome. Uh, also in partnership with the other guys I was talking about, uh, we're going to be trying to get some artists that we can do things with around here. And I'm still sending a lot of my tracks up to my cousin in uh, Philly. He was actually, dude, I've sent him a good four tracks, and he sent me some good fire music to go along with it. So I'm actually having to figure out, I'm hoping it's not going to be a whole EP that's just him, because right now he's the one that's really delivering. But, uh... <laughs> so, slow, slow it down, man. Let me get let me get mine in. Also hoping to, yeah, uh, help you out with your thing, you know? And that's another thing, uh, producers, uh, you know, a common dude is getting a lot of streams and your music is on his. That's another thing that, that's going to work in your favor. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And if guys, if you, uh, if you listen, there's going to be uh, more and more of Chris's music um, in the background of my stuff. Uh, I, I love having his stuff on it. It really has a, a great feel for, especially if you're going to be in the YouTube space or whatever, it's, it's great to have for background music, but I'm ready to see. I'm ready to see Panther Bread live. When are we gonna see Pan <laughs> Panther Bread live? Uh, hey, you, you said you're trying to come here and and and, and cook up something. Uh, we cooked up before. You helped me with one of my projects for the WWE thing experience. That was cool. <laughs> that was real cool. Um, you come in here and do it here and see what my how my my process is. Uh, I think I th I'm pretty sure. Especially here in Charlotte, my name's gonna start ringing. You know, I I absolutely think so. Absolutely. So you know, I mean, I'm not from here, but this is where I lay my head. So it's no disrespect into the area at all. You know, even though that you know that that really runs in my blood. You know, but you are gonna see a lot of life. I'm just I'm just trying to convert him to be a, a Carolina Panthers fan. That's never happened. <laughs> Well, it's not happening. I'm sorry. I can't do it. You know, I, I, hey, you know me. I'm, I'll be in the fire fighting. So come on, man. It's not happening. I can't do it. All right, um, man. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take, uh, I got a couple questions for you from uh, chat. And uh, we'll just answer these. And, uh, and then we can uh, get, you, get you out of here and back to your fam. All right. So first question is, what advice would you give to someone looking to start a music industry career coming straight out of college. 
Okay. Uh, if you've been listening, uh, I came straight out of college and I'm still pursuing what I'm doing, but I never lost faith in what the process is. Figure out what it is that you, first thing I will say, and this is something that, that this common guy, common dude, Jack told me, if you don't know music theory, learn it. It's going to help you out tremendously. I am not here to to play down on a music producer who we, who we either you call a beat maker or a producer. I'm not here to kill beat makers, but you want to learn theory because it, it helps you in the long run, longevity wise. Um, find out what it is that you really want to get into. If you want to chase radio, that's fine. Get you an artist that you, you, you stand behind and you, you build with that artist, okay? One, this will help you understand how that artist works, which also helps you understand how it works in the, in the studio and how you can help other people. Um, but you, you two or a group or whatever, you build together. I, again, I did not think that this music library concept existed. And I think when I told uh, Jack that at work one day, he, it kind of, huh, I didn't think about that. You know, I never thought about it. <clears throat> but it's it's a really good little 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 piece of the pie to get into. You have those producers who make sound kits. Um, mm -hmm. That's another good thing to do. So, for instance, if you have a song, for instance, that 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 just hits hot, use the sounds of that song and put them out as a kit because you have a lot of our uh, producers that like to kind of I hate to say it, they like to bite off of what was good at the time. So they might just take your drums or something of that nature. But you sell your kit because you, you just keep that 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 fire that was hot to get that song, keep it hot. Because you don't know when the next song is gonna come along. So you can make kits, uh, loops, um, splice, for instance. They they hire people to make sounds for us to pull in. But um that would be one of the good things I would say. So is what to get into when fresh out of it, keep doing. Learn your learn a learn an instrument, learn your theory. Um, and then once you learn that instrument, learn another. Network. Um That's another good and one. The, key, the main one I will say, collab. Because to constantly be in your own head all the time, you you get stale. And just listening to other people's stuff is not sometimes you might have to bounce something off somebody and get thick skin. <laughs> get thick skin uh, first and foremost I would honestly say thick skin as soon as you get out of college is the first thing that you should yeah. develop get thick skin yeah. just remember not everybody's not going to like everything you got no and you're going to have haters always you're gonna have haters. but then also remember all it takes is one um, I remember watching you know this is kind of off but I remember watching a, a video when Jay Z was in the studio with Timberland and Timberland was going through track after track after track. And Jay-Z just was not feeling any of those tracks. He finally wound up picking dirt off your shoulders. But like the first six tracks that he played, you will remember the song when you heard the, 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 the track. Busta Rhymes went on and, and sold platinum off of a couple of those tracks. But it wasn't what Jay-Z wanted. He wanted dirt off your shoulders. So it's not for everybody. But some is it, it, it's a trust of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So let's see. Um, do you think college is a must this day and age to be successful in the industry? I'd say no. 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 Um, no yeah. You, yeah. I, I had. I went to college because it was something. It was for me to kind of learn what the new. I was stuck in my head too. I'm used to pounding the pavement, putting my flyers up on the uh, the, the the telephone poles, handing out pieces of cardboard to people that they that you knew you walk up the street two two minutes later it was going to be tossed. You know, selling your stuff out of the back seat of your, out of the back of your trunk. I'm used to those days. So mm -hmm. I really went to school to understand how to get a dog, how to make all this stuff digital. So all the concept that I had learned with DJ and NPCs and all that stuff analog back in the day. All I'm trying to do is understand what you, what the new age is doing. Got to keep up with the times as well as understand the old. But yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would make the argument that college gives you the tools 
and not only the tools but the the discipline Maybe. like it kind of forces you to to manage your time and learn how to pump out whatever it is that you're doing whether it's writing a paper for psychology or whatever it teaches you how to manage your time how to be professional and then also like and then gives you the, the some of some of the education i'm not going to say all because i can i mean with these things right here we have we have all the knowledge in the world at our fingertips. So, I mean, you could go to YouTube here, listening to people like Chris talk and, and, and hear almost the same stuff as you'd hear in class. But uh, the biggest thing I think going to a college or some kind of school teaches you is how to learn and how to learn quickly because that is the name of the game. You always have to evolve. You always have to be changing. You always have to be learning new stuff. And you can ask Chris technology music it don't matter like everything any field that you're going in stuff's changing so fast now if you don't know how to learn and how to learn quick you're going to get left behind and, that would, and what he's saying has always been my philosophy is not the fact college is like you said not only is the responsibility it's persistence because you know if you don't get a scholarship you have to be persistent and constantly finding streams of way to keep you behind in school right so the irony to that is when I started going back to college, Jack will tell you, I was a single dad. So I went to work eight hours, came home and had to make sure that uh, dinner was cooked, kids were fed, their homework was done. And I had to sit down and make sure that my assignment was done before 11.59. <laughs> and um, that persistence and that responsibility, because remember I started here, I am in my 40s, that responsibility to know that you got a daytime job and just like what we're doing right now, you have to promote yourself. Well, I've been out of work on the clock for about four hours now. Well, guess what? Now I'm doing me. This is doing me. So that responsibility and it's stretching your days. That's what this is all about. You, 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 if you're, if you're a true producer, there's not a time that you have not laid in your bed and you'd be dead tired, but something comes in your head. And what, what do you do? If what I do is that's what these things that we have now are great for, because I'll put it on a record and I'll just beatbox what it is that I have in my head. If I'm too exhausted to come down here and put it down and put it on this uh, computer and then just do it later. It's always something. So you have to manage your time. Be on time. Be on time. If you have a deadline or you make a deadline for yourself, I'm going to make two tracks today. One's going to be this, one's going to be that. Make sure that you, even if it's just a concept, get it and come back. Awesome. Um, and then the last question besides how do you change your shirts, uh, what's, what's your favorite genre to produce? Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I, was, I was born as soulful, so it's kind of a mesh of R&B, neo-soul, hip-hop. It's all of those. Um, I, 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 there's so many times I have to pull myself out of doing boom back traps, <laughs> tracks, boom, boom, pat, boom, tat, tat, you know, and just maneuver it. But I'm also realizing I'm able to massage those things because I know, and I think I see something there that music theory sucks. It does until you know. When you understand it, it doesn't suck. It's, nah. it's funny at that point. It yeah. sucks trying to understand it. I get it. But I have a piano chords, music theory thing that sits up here. Sometimes I get lost on it. But when you when you find the rules and then you can break those rules and make some things that sound so great, oh my gosh. It's awesome. Well, dude, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And where can people find your stuff? All right. So you can go to well, we got a uh, pantherbread.wixsite.com. That's my Wix site right now. It's going to get built up. And of course, you can go to the Pantherbread on YouTube. So just type Pantherbread, all one word. Yes, Pantherbread is all one so, word. Wait, wait, wait. What's the, what's the website? I'll put it in chat right now. Pantherbread.wix. Wixsite.com. Okay. Yep. Cool. And then uh, Pantherbread on YouTube and. Uh, YouTube and on Twitter, I am at the Panther Bread, at the Panther Bread, and then on Instagram, Panther Bread. Everything all one word. Cool, man. 
well thank you so much and uh like i said you guys check out uh, the common dude youtube channel here in the next week or so and uh get to see a little bit behind the scenes in chris's studio so uh we'll see you then um thank you so much chris again i'm gonna stay on after he gets off and uh we can just chat for a second but i, I really appreciate it man Splat a plate go birds <laughs> all right dude i'll catch you later dude all right the flap the flap is this <laughs> what the are we is this pac-man is it i don't